Okay. We t in North Dakota, we tell a joke that um, there are three degrees of good. There is good, that's something that's very nice, and there is better, that's nicer still. And when something is very good, you don't say it's the best, you say it's swell. Huh? So we say, I would say, um, going to Norway is better. But being invited to Norway is swell. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. <laughs> when my family left, my families left Norway, um, they were husman and they were uh, crafters. And they left because there was no way that they could really make a living anymore. Um, many of them were in a position not to inherit, and so they had to go looking for land and opportunities. And here was a great wide state called North Dakota where all the mountains had been removed. <laughs> so they thought this was heaven and settled there. It's absolutely the coldest part of North America and it's sometimes the most difficult and therefore it's perfect for Norwegians. It's just <laughs> the only trouble now is that we've followed suit with Norway and we have oil. So it's the pastors in the northwestern part of the state where I come from say you can never tell who has oil because no one wants to show off. That's one of the biggest offenses possible for a Norwegian American. So we don't paint our houses out there. We, that's too much. That's swell. That's for other people. That's Yankees that paint their houses. We just let them weather. But when you go in the house, then you find out what swell really is. <laughs> it's hidden there. <laughs> so the pastors say that when... You can tell who in the congregation has gotten oil because they will either, either come to church in a brand new pickup or they will take a long vacation. And when they come back, they won't say anything about where they've been. <laughs> it's kind of perverse. So um, I'm delighted. My family came from... Um, over in Opland, and my mother's family came from Lexvik, just across from Trondheim. We, we always called it Trondheim, when, and it's taken me a long time to say anything different. We, our families were Trondheimers, my mother's family, and they came from the old Haugians. Um, they were pietists and proud of it, and my father's family came from the old Prussians, the Norwegian Synod. So my mother lived her whole life long with uncertainty about her salvation, and my father, every night at devotions, would preach to her. <laughs> I heard some of the best preaching of my whole life at the table. <laughs> my father bearing witness to my mother that she had been saved by Christ Jesus and not condemned. <laughs> You remember these kinds of conversations, some of you. So I was born in 1945, right at the end of the war. <clears throat> After, right at the, right in 1946, King Haakon came from Norway and took the train across northern North Dakota from one end of the state to the other, and he stopped at every crossing along the way. Every place there was any place that there were people, and of course there were Norwegians wall to wall, all the way across. The people with him said that he heard Norwegian spoken in every dialect, spoken in Norway, on the plains of North Dakota during that trip. Um, by 1950, Norwegian was gone. It was spoken only by the elderly and those who had roots. So the next generation ahead of me still had the language and has the language. 
But when we spoke Norwegian in school, when I was a child, we were punished. Because the Yankees could never tell the difference between Norwegian and German. And they were sure, even though we came with Lefse in our pockets, that we were German spies. <laughs> it goes to tell what you can get by with in America, I'll tell you that. Huh? So, um, I'm very sorry not to have the language. I can sometimes understand, sometimes I understand a lot more than I should. Um, sometimes I can even speak a little, but I was up in Tromso, sitting out in front of a store while Carolyn was shopping. I was sitting out there smoking my pipe and a man came and asked me for directions. So I answered him in trashling, the language that my mother spoke. And he looked at me kind of quizzically and he said, you sound like you come from a museum. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't speak it anymore. I, uh, sometimes my mother is dead and my grandmother is dead and I have one old auntie, 95, so deaf that she can't hear a thing. So there's nobody left <laughs> that speaks it. Though so once I was preaching down in Arizona where all the old people in North Dakota go to for the winters now and some five people came and stood waiting to speak to me and all of them spoke my language. And when they began speaking it to me, I began to weep <laughs> because it was my heart's language and now lost. So I'm very sorry not to have it. I expect if I got immersed in it for a while, I could find it again, but I can't find anybody to get immersed with, so <laughs> it's difficult. So the question that I am supposed to address is why am I a Lutheran? I have to say I never had any choice about it. And if I got a choice about it, I would feel terrible. It's never been an alternative. It's always been right at the center of our whole life as a family and of my life, as Carolyn and my life together. When I was 14, my father gave me a copy of Bo Yert's book, The Hammer of God, and he gave me one other um, why I am a Lutheran by Hermann Sasa. And I have read and reread these books all of my life, and they have been load stars for me. So true North Stars that I have looked to. And I have, when I was still teaching, I required every one of my students to read Boyard's. Um, so that they would get their feet on the ground. I think you can get some of the best answers to these questions from such writers. But when I went to seminary as a young man, um, I started reading Luther, and that has been my profession all of my life. I am a Luther scholar, and so I read Luther all of the time. Uh, my grandmother thought this was a fault. She said he's ragging on Luther all of his life. He should read more of the Bible and less Luther. <laughs> of course, I had to read as much of both, so um, she was just checking on me. Even though I was old enough to know better, she was never convinced of that. <laughs> so, so I'm going to answer the question with... The, an argument that I learned from Luther early on. I'm going to address the question with um, quotations from Luther's Freedom of the Christian. There he writes, a Christian is the perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. At the same time, the Christian is the perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. 
So we'll look at these two statements and hope that together they add up to a persuasive reason. Hmm? Sometimes I think the question, why am I a Lutheran, is, should be stated, why am I still a Lutheran? <laughs> After all the trouble the Lutherans have been through. But again, um, these are not alternatives. The word freedom is a very interesting word. It is particularly important to Americans, of course, but it was even more important to Luther. His name in German was Luther, L-U-T-T-E-R or L-U-D-D-E-R. Um, he pronounced it L-U-T-H-E-R or Luther, punning on the word for freedom in Greek, Eleutherius. His whole witness is concerned with freedom, the bondage of the will and the freedom of the gospel. So <clears throat> this is a very important word in our vocabulary as Lutherans, one we use over and over again. My grandfather on my mother's side um, was born in Leksvik and immigrated with his father to Norway when he was a young man. His father's name was Axel Vinge. We pronounced it over there. V-I-N-G-E or Vinga, I suppose you'd say, huh? He was, um, they were musicians, um, both of them. They, they both had perfect pitch. <laughs> And the choir the, in the little church that they belonged to sang behind them. Um, they walked across, all the way across North Dakota to find the most God-forsaken land in southern Saskatchewan, and there they homesteaded. And that little town became a Haugian town until quite recently, now there's no, hardly anybody left and not even the Haugians want to stay there anymore. So, so it's, it's the church is just hanging on by on the edge. Grandpa used to say that if you want to frustrate an, Ameri a frustrate an American, he was a loyal Canadian and always suspicious of Yankees. He said, if you want to frustrate an American, always ask him what he's free for. What is freedom for? Grandpa said, he'll always say freedom to set someone else free. Well, what are you setting them free for? And then he'll just look at you quizzically and not be able to understand the question. Freedom is a strange word, and it's gotten a strange definition in our public life. Nowadays, when you hear the word freedom spoken in the U.S. and even now in Canada, and I think probably here too, you hear freedom as detachment. Freedom is being able to detach yourself from obligations and people who bring obligations, and people who cause expectations. So freedom, Janis Joplin's definition, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Freedom is being able to move away from. The real question is what can you move to? It's my grandpa's question. What how do you attach? The Lutheran understanding of freedom begins with attachment. Christ Jesus has attached himself to you. He has taken hold of you. He took hold of you in your baptism. He took hold of you at the table here with these words, this is my body given for you. He has attached himself to you. 
And because he has attached himself to you through the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments, because he's taken you unto himself, hmm? do you remember the words of the small catechism? All this Jesus has done that I may be his own. Live under him and serve him. Eh? You see, we're attached to him. He is attached to us. And because we're attached, freedom huh, takes the form of belonging to him. Hmm? It is belonging to him. Being gripped and held by him. Being defined by him. And so when we talk about being attached to Christ Jesus, right away we begin speaking of a specific set of gifts that he has given you. He has forgiven your sins. He has delivered you from other powers that try to define you. He has promise to raise you from the dead. He has freed you from the power of sin. I like to tell this story about an old Norwegian pastor who became president of the what was called in those days the Norwegian Lutheran Church. Until 1940, then Americans got a little wary of international connections and started calling it the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Anyway, it was all the Norwegians in America. And he became president. His name was J.A. Osgord. You know, we have preserved some things in America among the Norwegians, and we we're particularly proud of people who can get four A's into their name. Huh? <laughs> this is a Norwegian habit, you know, of stealing all the nouns and putting them all into one name. Huh? So my dear wife, her maiden name is Storosli. She got only two, but she fights for both of them. Huh? <laughs> she won't give them up. So we have J.A. Osgord, A-A-S-G-A-A-R-D. Huh? <laughs> he was a great pastor and a stern old man, tough. This was in 1925 when Eau Claire was a logging town full of Norwegians who cut timber all week and came into town and drank all weekend and went back to the woods again. <laughs> He was a strong man, and he had to be. So the, um, when he was pastor, a woman came to him, young woman. He had performed her wedding some weeks earlier, months maybe. <clears throat> she said, Pastor, I have to talk to you. He could see from her distress that there was something profoundly troubling her. <clears throat> so he said, you know, in the hymnary, the Norwegian-American hymnal, <clears throat> there's a service for somebody like you. It's the service of private confession. So she knelt beside his desk, and he knelt beside her. And this is what she said. She had been a nurse at the hospital. <clears throat> One of the doctors had taken interest in her, and she had had sexual relations with him. She became pregnant. She went to the doctor about her pregnancy, and he arranged for her to have an abortion in the um, operating room at night. So the baby was aborted. The pregnancy ended. The relationship ended. Of course, that's generally what happens. 
<clears throat> and when the relationship ended, she was left alone. A young man in the congregation took an interest in her. He began pursuing her. When he called her, she said she thought she ought to tell him about herself, but she didn't feel like she could. And so the courtship went along, and it was getting more serious, and she thought she should tell him, but she couldn't. <clears throat> he proposed to her, and she thought she should tell him, but she couldn't. <laughs> they were married. She thought she should tell him, but she couldn't. And now she said, every time he f touches me, all I can think about is how I've betrayed him. She said, I, I'm, I want to die. Dr. Osgord stood up, put his hand on her head, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sin. And he made the sign of the cross on her forehead. She stood up. She said, Now I suppose I should tell my husband this story. Pastor Osgord said, What story? What story? That's the forgiveness of sins. That's why it's so desperately important. That's why Christ died to forgive sinners. And that's why the word of forgiveness is the most important word that we have. She went back to her husband rejoicing. The marriage was long and fruitful because Christ Jesus carried her sins. She no longer had to. Hmm? The word of forgiveness is deliverance from something that has grasped us inappropriately, captured us. I'll tell you one other story. I'm from the Vietnam War people. I was one of the people that was of age during the Vietnam War and lived through that whole controversy in the US. So I have many friends who are Vietnam vets. They're interesting people. I was sitting on an airplane one day, which I've done too much of over the years, and I was sitting next to a man as big as I am, and we filled up the two seats to overflowing. We, the poor man sitting in the third seat was squirming. And, <laughs> and we, um, we were sitting, visiting, and the guy said to me, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. He said, you are? Do you mind if I talk? If we talk, I said, no, I don't. I, I used to wear my clerics every Sunday morning. I always wear my clerics when I have to preach, but when I would, I would always very carefully change clothes after church because I didn't want to run a confessional in the airplane seat. That was, you know, I would work all morning and be go, going home to work all week, and I thought I could have the afternoon off, and so I would hide my collar. <laughs> But he knew I was a pastor somehow. So we started talking and he, he started telling, rehearsing memories from during the war. It got worse. And it got worse. And pretty soon he was weeping telling me these stories. Finally, I said to him, have you confessed the sins that are most troublesome to you? He said, I didn't know I was confessing. 
I said, you've been confessing ever since the plane took off. And when I hear somebody confessing, I am under obligation to the Lord Jesus to say this. <laughs> the plane was landing, <laughs> and I stood up in my seat. And the flight attendants, I'm blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I put my hand on his head. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. He said, you've got to be kidding. That's the best thing I ever heard in my life. And then he began to weep. Here two big bellied men, barrel chested, stood holding one another while the plane was landing, <laughs> weeping for joy. <laughs> That's the forgiveness of sins. He came to see me every day in my office for eight days running. And he would come into my office and would say, is it still the same message? And I would say, Christ Jesus told me to tell you that again. And I would put my hand on his head and absolve him. That's the forgiveness of sins. What does it do? In forgiveness, Christ Jesus takes up all the attachments that have cl cling to you from the past and hold you in bondage, and he breaks them one by one, one by one, to free you, hmm? to free you. At the same time, he takes on the powers that would define you. Lots of people don't like to talk about the devil anymore. They think it's kind of an embarrassment, you know. Huh? Well, anybody who's been in, in any kind of a tangle with the devil knows it's, knows it's not a joke. I mean, this is a power. The devil is a power that attacks our sense of relationship to Jesus and undermines it. That's his, as Luther said, the devil has a nose for faith. He can smell it. And when he smells it, he seeks it out and seeks to destroy it. And so some of the people who are deepest in faith have the deepest temptations. They struggle with the strongest attacks, and it's Christ Jesus' joy to break the devil's power. Hmm? This is why he descended into hell to have a victory tour. Huh? After he defeated the devil on the cross, he went down there to twist his nose and poke fun at him. I thought you had me, didn't you? <laughs> Go back to hell, you devil. That's where you belong. You stay here. <laughs> you see, that's, he, this is Christ's glory that he defeats these powers that can define us. Well, some of you know the shape of these powers in depression or in guilt or in fear. I had a very close friend who was Latvian. There are wonderful Lutherans in Latvia. And many of them immigrated to the U.S. after the war, and he, his wife died. I used to call him and lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I would call him every once in a while. I would say, well, Eagle, how are things now? He said, I have lost my country, and I have lost my wife. There is nothing left for me. Nothing left for me. You know, in depression, how we get caught. Well, Christ is risen. He has stood up. <laughs> he has been raised for you. And because he has been raised for you, he breaks these powers. He breaks their grip. Hmm? Egil said, I'm like a dog now. He said, I keep going back to her grave. Day after day, he said, Jim, you have to call me and tell me because I can hardly believe it anymore. You have to believe it for me. Huh? Well, this is the power, you know. 
Finally, Christ Jesus has taken power over death. <laughs> That's his great, greatest victory, you know. It's his greatest victory. You know, every once in a while, Norwegian musicians are able to sneak some things into English. Egil Hovland has given us this wonderful music. Stay with us for it is evening. Huh? For many of us it is evening. We know death is coming. We know it's not far away. Our gray heads give us away. Huh? It's coming. There's no way out. But Christ Jesus has gone into the grave for us to upstand, huh? to raise us so that death can have no dominion. Huh? Death can have no dominion any longer. Huh? Christ rules us. Huh? He has taken, he has attached himself to us. And so our freedom is this. We are free from the powers of destruction. Just so we are also free to attach ourselves to others. We don't have to work on ourselves any longer. Hmm? We are not in bondage anymore. We are free and so we can attach ourselves where Christ calls us. With justification, there is another word that's equally important among Lutherans, and that's vocation. We are called. Christ frees us for a purpose. He frees us, not so that we run in circles talking all the time about how free we are. That's what we did when I graduated from high school. In the States, we could buy these old cars for 50 American dollars. They were, they were great, big Strassenkreuzer, you know, huge cars, several tons, and we could buy them for $50. <laughs> so when we graduated from high school, we drove these old cars around and around the school, blowing our horns. We are free, we are free, we were fr are free, but we didn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> we didn't know what to do. All we could do was drive around the school blowing our horns. <laughs> well, Christ Jesus sets you free. You are free for. You are free for your family. Hmm? Free to become a husband or a wife, an aunt or an uncle, a brother or a sister, huh? a son. Or a daughter. Huh? Can you imagine? My mother died in 1974 of breast cancer. My father remarried in a great big hurry and nearly was killed by his second wife. <laughs> Terrible. Huh? I had objected to a second marriage and I was the last person he wanted to talk to. But I had something no one else had. I had all his memories. I was the only one left who remembered all of his years of ministry. So he would call me up and say, would you like to go to coffee? And I'd say, I'll be glad to, uh, glad to have coffee because I knew what was coming. He would sit and rehearse memories and my job Knowing those stories was to listen to them all over again. He said, when I talk to you, I don't have to explain anything. That's a big advantage. Well, I knew the stories by heart. He could have numbered them. He could have said, number 121, and I would have been able to tell you the whole story myself. <laughs> but you know what that is to be a son or a daughter, huh? You love, and because you love, you take these stories that you've heard way too many times. Stories you know so well you can trace every embellishment all the way back to the beginning, like you were some 
biblical critic or something. I mean, you can hear the story and tell it all over again, but the telling of that story is the imparting of life, you see. You have a vocation to be a father, to be a mother. No, I am best of far. <laughs> and I tell the stories. And I embellish them joyfully. <laughs> so that my grandchildren listen to my stories and laugh with joy. Huh? This is a vocation, a calling. We're attached. You have a, we have vocation as husband and wife. Huh? 46 years we have been in the same bed. And we haven't murdered one another. Huh? Huh? We're rejoicing in 46 years, and we're counting on getting some more. <laughs> I mean, I don't want her to get away. Huh? This is a vocation, a calling. You have a vocation in your work. Hmm? You do something so very well with your hands and with your head hmm? that your neighbor depends on you for those things. Huh? And so you have a calling from God to attach yourself through your hands to your, to your neighbors. You have a vocation in the church. You have a vocation as a citizen of Norway. Huh? To participate in Norwegian public life and contribute to it. Huh? I mean, you have been called to this. God has, God has seen that you're useful. He's making you useful. So he's detached you from the powers that would destroy you. He's attached himself to you so that you can attach yourself to your neighbors and be salty and be full of light and be yeasty, full of leaven. What's better than that? So when my grandkids come to the house, when Carolyn went to law school, she taught me to bake. I said, I'm not going to eat store-bought bread for anything. You're going to have to make arrangements. So she taught me to bake. <laughs> I was the solution to my problem. I had better ideas than that, but now I love to bake. And when my grandchildren come, I make big cinnamon rolls that are full of butter and just oozing calories. Huh? <laughs> I put way too much sugar in them and I put maple syrup on the bottom of them and when the kids eat them they get feisty and wild and they <laughs> their parents say, don't give them so much sugar. I said, my, my grandkids, I'm going to give them all the sugar. <laughs> Huh? This is a vocation, huh? a calling huh? to spoil your grandchildren. Huh? I love it. Huh? Uh, this is a gift of God. Huh? So we have detachments because of an attachment to Christ Jesus. And our attachment to Christ Jesus frees us to attach ourselves in our families, in, a con in our congregations, huh? at work, in our public life. <laughs> These are the joys. Huh? So that's why I'm a Lutheran. I mean, I would never give it up. If I started thinking about quitting, I would think I was sick. This would not be evidence of freedom. It would be evidence of disintegration. I, I'd be lost. I wouldn't know who or what I was anymore. I'd be adrift, driving around the school, blowing my horn with no place to go. <laughs> okay. Well, that's enough, do you think? Did, it, did you understand what I was saying by any chance? <laughs>